Thank you for joining us, everyone, to uh, our session with the title Preserving the Human Potential and Spirit of the Internet. I'm Julia Kleuber. I work with Ashoka, and I'm happy to welcome three of our fellows, uh, researchers, social entrepreneurs, activists. Um, we have a very um, vivid group here. I'm welcoming uh, Apra Gupta. He's the executive director of the Internet uh, Freedom Foundation. Um, I'm also welcoming Bharav uh, Palavali. He's the co-founder of Fields of View. And I'm really happy that Kuldeep Dante Vadia is joining us. He's the co-founder and CEO of Reap Benefits. And I want to kick us off. So we have 30 minutes and I figured I'm going to kick us off with a more lightweight question before we dive a little deeper in the topics that each of the fellows is working on and the way they're shaping the internet and uh, policies around the internet. Um, so my first question to uh, all of you would be, what is your first memory of the internet? Like uh, going far back into your childhood memories, maybe what was your first contact with the internet? Just a really brief kind of statement to kick us off. And uh, Kuldeep, do you wanna, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll make it brief. So my first memory was uh, uh, my friend and I were told that there is this amazing, back then an amazing website, uh, even now Google, and we had to, um, uh, we had to do research on our project. Um, and uh, my friend went on the web search engine. And he's just looking at the search engine. And he's like, you know, where is the information I'm looking for? Uh, so we were told that you can get any information. And he thought, <laughs> if you just look at the search engine, you get this information. So yeah, that's my first memory that uh, I can get any information uh, um, uh, as soon as I want it. This was in grade seven or eight. So yeah, that's my first memory of the uh, internet. Nice, great memory. Uh, Baraf, what about you? What was your first memory of the internet? Um, so I'm what uh, I'm what is called a Doordarshan kid uh, in India uh, because we only had the, the national broadcaster at home. We didn't have cable television. And there was a show in the late 80s called uh, Indra Dhanush, uh, which was probably India's first science fiction sort of fantasy show. And these kids come together to build a computer in their garage. And for me, the idea of uh, children building something like a computer on their own and then connecting it to uh, the World Wide Web or uh, as they used it to time travel of all the things uh, was a remarkable thing to view on uh, television, on a <laughs> cathode ray tube television of all the things. So that's my earliest memories of time travel and using the web and satellite communication uh, 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 from the TV in the late 1980s, actually. Nice. Apa, what about you? Similar memories or <laughs> completely different ones? No, uh, I think I fit between Bharat and Kuldeep and it just speaks to <laughs> when you came to the internet, what time, what speed was there. So I remember pressing the refresh button a lot, mm -hmm. just wanting the website to load faster and it didn't. It was really painful. <laughs> I think Snowden describes it to some extent, permanent record where he says that yeah. it wasn't the same way it was back then. And I remember uh, indulging in what uh, people would call piracy. I used Napster, <laughs> I used Limefire, I used Kaza. <laughs> I, I, I downloaded a lot of books also, and I think it uh, allowed me access to media I wouldn't get in a local library, yeah. or I couldn't get uh, music access to it. And it's been very beneficial to all of that. Nice. So as you can hear, we all grew up around the same time with the internet, with the modern sound and like a low bandwidth. Um, but even more exciting that all of us are still working in the technology field. Um, let's dive a little deeper into uh, the topics some of you are working on. I want to start or uh, continue with Apar. Uh, you're working with the Internet Freedom Foundation, working on ensuring that tech respects fundamental rights. I guess that's a, a busy, busy field um, from, from what I can tell when I read the news. So what are you and your organization working on right now when it comes to preserving the potential, the spirit of, of the internet, the title of our session? Yeah. Can you so, give us a brief, yeah. yeah. So the internet as we came to love it and we still do love it and so many people love it. It's uh, basically allowing a degree of human facility and function. Uh, it allows people to grow, explore, 
go into areas of their personality, but it also has such a dangerous and dark side now, the cybersecurity threat. But also it's, there's an incredible level of concentration of power, both with uh, the public sector, which is the government, as well as the private sector. And we want that to be there centered more in human welfare, individual liberty. So much more tangibly, the issues such as broadband access, a lot of people don't have it. It's cut off, the internet shutdowns. Uh, there is uh, antitrust, there's tech lash, et cetera. Innovation, can people still build the kind of tools, products and services they were able to build earlier? Um, artificial intelligence, how will it impact our future of work? And will it actually result in automated decision making, for instance, insurance premiums for people without them being stakeholders? So it's a very wide, diverse field because tech is becoming flat fundamental rights from freedom of speech and expression, which used to be traditional, uh, one area, but it started impacting livelihood, employment, all core facets of our social, personal, and professional life. So we work on that and we are an advocacy organization. So we take the research which is there, we make it actionable, we center it in public discourses, activate the public and actually bridge the gap between public policy and the public by just making it really, really tangible. So if you think about organizations which are brought such as for instance, tactical tech, which, uh, which, which design experiences around how data interacts with you, or you think about uh, the electronic foundation, which does strategic litigation, we're some, somewhere discovering our own jujitsu, our own style of fighting these threats in India. And uh, we are hopefully on the path to greater discovery. And I hope this community of and conversation helps us through this. Thank you so much for kicking us off. Um, and yeah, indeed, it's a broad field. And um, so is the field of uh, policy, a field that uh, Bharath is working on. And while policy is oftentimes, um, I don't know, referred to as this very dry and like text heavy field, uh, Bharath has a different uh, approach to it in his organization. Uh, they are bringing uh, games and uh, simulations into uh, the, the, the game, so to say, in order to help to make uh, better policies. Um, so Bharath, why don't you give us an example of um, a game you designed in order to help people to work on better policies? Uh, so actually, Julia, that connects to what Afar was talking about at the very end, right? And the idea that uh, uh, technology and ICT particularly is all pervasive today in our lives. It affects us across the board when it comes to all forms of livelihood generation and how we function largely. And what that really means is uh, it's largely a tool uh, that can be used to reinforce existing power structures or sort of increase power hierarchy as well. Uh, so what we do primarily with respect to our tools is uh, how do we make sure that people are not left out more in the pub, in the policy making uh, process? How are people, how can people participate more? Because increasingly uh, policy making is also moving towards uh, a, a tech platform, right? Uh, even the, as simple as participation in evaluation, uh, participation and feedback. I, many people cannot, for example, even get recourse in the form of, hey, my electricity bill is uh, a lot. I need to get it rectified unless you know how to uh, file a claim on the website or unless you have a smartphone that you can use to register a complaint through the app, right? So uh, the gap is very large. So our work focuses on how do you reduce that gap? How do you make it uh, more inclusive? And how do you ensure that uh, all the different kinds of people that we are talking about, all of us have different visions for the future. So how do you also sort of in some ways uh, reconcile yourselves with the idea that all the futures that we are looking at needs to be thought about? So a few of the games that we use largely, for example, are uh, about these two portions, right? One is how do you bring in different uh, 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 visions for the future together? so that we understand each other a little better. I think Ashoka likes to use the word empathy quite a bit, right? Uh, so it is about building that uh, empathy. Uh, and the second one is also largely about decreasing uh, 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 divergence, so to speak, uh, because often public policy is really about uh, avoiding pitfalls rather than about being efficient, right? I mean, efficiency is a misnomer when it comes to public policy. 
So we have these two tools. One is largely uh, aimed at training, where we use it to train uh, future policymakers on understanding all of these aspects of complexity when it comes to public policy. Uh, uh, it's called Cantor's World, where they play the role of this overarching god in the country, and they plan between the year 1990 and 2010. And the second tool is largely a tool that we use with multiple stakeholders to essentially look at futures, uh, multiple futures, and not place moral judgment on any one of these futures, right? Uh, because we are quick to judge people. So a game is a good way to overcome that uh, barrier to a certain extent. Nice. So we're already moving towards solutions and reimagining <laughs> re the internet, uh, not like staying too much on the status quo. Um, Kuldeep, I read on your website, the website of Reap uh, Benefit, added you're building young action-based citizen champions, um, working a lot with young people. Uh, what's a creative way that um, younger folks are using um, the internet or leveraging the internet um, to create change? Do you have some examples for us? Uh, sure, sure, Julia. So I, I think uh, uh, the way we uh, at Reap Benefit in a way recognize ourselves is a, is a do tank. You know, how do we get citizens to uh, get involved, uh, like what Bharat said, not only in the decision-making process, but also in the problem-solving process. Uh, and the focus is uh, our local community. I mean, there is no um, better a place than the local community which you are a part of or which you participate in. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, for young people, um, especially in urban centers, uh, whether uh, you come from served or underserved communities, uh, technology uh, is at least viewed uh, as a tool which can you know, uh, democratize information. Um, and can also distribute uh, the ability to solve these local issues. So that uh, power uh, uh, is perceived by young people. So let me give you a few specific uh, examples. So in uh, one of the underserved uh, communities uh, we were uh, working in, um, uh, it was kind of a hotbed for uh, urban flooding uh, in the city. And generally, it's an, uh, the government uh, is not very participative about that. Uh, we had young people uh, using... Uh, simple tools and marking all the places, you know, which kind of get um, flooded during rains uh, and it makes uh, uh, living conditions very, very difficult um, uh, for these uh, young people. Now, once they started marking uh, this information, they were able to take this information, go to an elected representative and, you know, in a very specific manner, show where are all the hotspots of urban flooding. And then they took this information and reached out to a larger community. Um, and uh, now they're thinking of building a low cost mesh network uh, in and around that area, which can start communicating uh, just before uh, the monsoons uh, that, you know, which part is going to get flooded. And now these young kids are thinking of influencing the municipal election, uh, which is going to, you know, uh, happen hopefully uh, eight to 12 months uh, from now uh, in the city uh, we are a part of. Um, the other, other thing, um, uh, Julia, is that uh, air quality is a very big issue uh, in most uh, uh, cities uh, in the country. And at this point, we don't even have uh, hyperlocal devices uh, which measure air quality at a hyperlocal level because um, it's not in the interest of the government uh, to have multiple um, uh, sensors, you know, which is measuring air quality. Uh, young people are building a network of developing hyperlocal air quality uh, monitors and sensors. That data is being uploaded on maps uh, across the city. And now that is leading to you know, decision making. And young people are able to leverage uh, technology data and influence uh, decision makers. So these are just two examples uh, wherein we are bridging the gap uh, and making more uh, policy, which is more informed, but comes from action and comes from experience. So that's what we are looking at. Ah, nice. I like the direction this is going into because a lot of times when we talk about technology, we're talking about high tech and like on a very kind of uh, far removed level from like everyday life. So how do you reconnect um, the internet and also technological developments to uh, the reality of many people? And how is it also important to have offline measures to, to give people access in a way that they don't have to like be familiar with like uh, several interfaces um, and so on. So maybe on um, this note, um, let's, because when we talk about collective intelligence and collaboration, like the foundation is an open web. 
Um, and there's many threats to the open web. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the, the challenges that you see. So what are the biggest challenges um, to this open web, but then also to not like um, fall into a deep depression about things uh, to talk about what are concrete examples on how to overcome uh, these challenges. Um, and this is an open question to all of you, um, whoever has a thought or idea uh, can start. So I just to venture, uh, 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 what's 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 at stake here is that uh, the web and the open web has been built on foundational values and network protocols, which do call for a level of distribution, right? And there are broad divisions when you study the network architecture as well. So, but the network architecture quite often and the layering which is within it. And the policy prescriptions are today under stress because there is a growing level of centralization. So I think one thing which is happening is that uh, one, there is centralization. And the second is in terms of how, how successful the web is being despite that centralization. So we need to acknowledge it is resulting in a higher degree of human facility. It's not like people are not finding use of the internet now, more people are actually getting connected. So we do need to be optimistic about what it's providing people. I think it's the political nature of the conversation which, which, which we had while growing up, goes back to your first questions of being explorers, right? And to bring that uh, is, is, is kind of tough. I think the way to approach it is number one, to uh, focus on it as a social problem rather than just a technology problem. And I think both Bharat and Kuldeep's work is excellent there. And the second is also to approach problems from a very evidentially basis and uh, limiting them and then identifying conventional areas of how law and justice have proceeded. One other learning I took from another panel was that uh, we always looked at policy and governance systems from the uh, lens of law, uh, justice, institutions, but what if we can do it within technology itself by way of integrating social value and individual liberty within the design process. And I think that conversation is starting. I think when we uh, have been uh, critical in our voices for such a long time, uh, technologists have listened. They haven't uh, paid as much attention, but I think I, I sense the change is happening. I, I can already do sense it. Nice. So Baraf, is that, uh, is that reflected in your work? Like what frameworks are you using when you're designing policies? For yeah, I think just building on what Apar said, right? Going back to a point he made about uh, the idea and the spirit behind the internet and uh, the uh, web and uh, the physical architecture underlying it. Uh, unfortunately, what many of us forget is uh, while we market and while we think of, of the internet as open and as something that is liberating, uh, the underlying technological framework isn't. Uh, it is deeply centralized, right from the domain name servers that we have today to how routing happens. It is extremely centralized, right? And uh, that does pose uh, a problem because in one, in one manner, you are consolidating everything. But at the same time, you are saying we need to have a distributed system. We need to have an open system. So they are at uh, odds with each other. So it and thankfully, uh, like Apar said, there is discussion around that. There is conversation around that. Even the uh, arguments at ICANN, for example, uh, or the arguments with setting up multiple DNS servers, for example. So it's not a space that is has not uh, uh, acknowledged these differences. Uh, you see them cropping up. You see them evolving, and that's that's a nice thing to see. Uh, I'll just quickly talk about this one ad that I saw recently. Uh, it's an ad of uh, this uh, uh, probably girl uh, who is uh, in her late teens, so who's serving food in a restaurant. And then she uh, uh, gets a notice saying her class is about to start on the phone. Uh, so she tells her, uh, I'm not sure if it's her mother or relative in the kitchen, that she needs to go out to take uh, to uh, attend her class. And then she goes and sits in the car to, uh, to attend the class. And when they pan out of the car, it's on this hilly place, right? Uh, where there's nothing but this one little canteen where people are eating food. Uh, 
that is the visual that we like to create for the internet often that it empowers people in that in that manner that this girl who has otherwise no access to an education system is now able to afford learning at her own pace which empowers her in different ways right now it's a wonderful imagery to create but then what we also need to ask at the same time is why is this girl having to do that why is this girl not having the same opportunities as the rest of the people across the world uh, in her same age group who have access to all these other facilities right the reason i gave this example is it is not it should not be seen as a substitute for other systems it should not be seen as a way uh, to leapfrog out of other systems because if that access is not there what tends to happen is you increase the gap between the haves and the have nots even more permanently right the simplest example is during the lockdown in india uh, which was a substantially long period of lockdown uh, you had these celebratory messages doing the rounds of how somebody shared a video of a tea stall vendor uh, who lost all his business because uh, nobody was able to come and have uh, tea at his place and after that uh, his business boomed uh, so the power of social media was celebrated right now the fact that it's only one tea stall vendor who benefited from the viral nature of that video and not everybody right so we need to acknowledge that and understand that that is where the problem is and that goes back fundamentally to the prop to the point uh, that technologists need to start become uh, people who understand social systems better and they start they need to start become becoming responsible uh, social scientists so to speak right because often uh, we see the two as uh, separate things and unless we start combining them unless we start thinking them uh, together then it's not really going to be addressed uh, the reason i sort of gave this uh, uh, example is i'll go back to that tv show that i referred to in the beginning right about time travel and multiple futures and all of that unless all of us agree on the fact that this is the future that we are working towards there will be this challenge that we uh, continue to face and the only way to address those challenges is to have those platforms and those spaces for conversation to resolve these di uh, differences to a certain extent and understand e e understanding each other better is only a step towards creating something that all of us can use in a more effective manner Uh, so it's it's a question just of that minor transition that we are uh, often missing, right? Sorry, I went off on a different tangent. So I'll no, no, no. It's super, super interesting. So technologies, uh, technologists have to like open themselves up and and like go deeper into social sciences also. But what what is with the population that is not into technology? Like what degree of understanding or technical intuition do they mm -hmm. need um, in order to? yeah shape policies and understand what effects like using a certain tool might have on on their privacy and so on i think this is a very uh, a field that we can discuss like for for hours <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. but kuldeep when you're talking about the young people in that you're working with um not saying that you're not also a young person um but are they using are they building their own tools or are they adopting uh, platforms that are already out there because um, when you talked about the the sensors uh, for air quality uh, i assume this is something that that needs to be built somehow from scratch or the different modules have to be uh, brought together um yeah yeah a, a combination of both uh, julia but just to build a little bit on what uh, bharat said right and uh, just kind of uh, like giving it a grounds up view i think the intent of technology uh, always seem to uh, decentralize and democratize uh, but the more i am seeing it work on the field uh, it has an absolute opposite uh, effect uh, there is there is not only centralization from a technical uh, level but there is also centralization from a cultural level uh, right um, uh, and uh, that is a very important thing to call out um, so even in the world of technology while while you are onboarding people uh, uh, who 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 have been on the other side of the digital divide uh, there is there is a there is segmentation even there you know there is a segment uh, which is centralized um, and there is a segment which is centralized which does not have uh, you know the same kind of uh, exposure and the second thing i am seeing is that um, most technologists have viewed technology as just as a medium uh which which assumes that you'll distribute knowledge and magic will happen 
Um, I think technology is more than that. Technology can also distribute the ability to solve and get a lot of people um, who have solved uh, on board, which I don't think technology is doing. So there is a power hierarchy even here, um, wherein wherein the 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 knowledge uh, trumps the doing, which but technology can kind of uh, 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 level uh, that playing uh, field as well. And the final thing is when we are looking at real social issues, um, uh, I like what Bharat said. It is not a silver bullet because solving real issues does not give you instant gratification, and there's no dopamine kick uh, in that. Uh, and technologies have to understand that you cannot use principles of dopamine kick and instant gratification in trying to solve social issues, right? Wherein the gratification is way more delayed. Uh, with this context, uh, Julia, I think there's a combination of both we are seeing. We see young people uh, trying to build from scratch, but young people also going out and leveraging what is already there and building on that. Uh, uh, but the concept of building is generally uh, uh, on the lower side because the culture of building in general is um, is is in minority, right? Uh, you you don't like to build, um, and even while you're trying to build, uh, there are tools um, which uh, which which claim to be open source, but um, uh, just when it comes to data privacy, when it comes to data accuracy, when it comes to data sharing, uh, things are pretty uh, shady. Um, so open source becomes a very uh, uh, becomes an umbrella term which is feel good in nature. Uh, but um, the fine print, uh, there is always uh, uh, some question around that. But we see young people uh, uh, be, being able to adapt much faster and identify tools much faster, which is quicker. Uh, but uh, the fine print around that sometimes uh, is quite debatable. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We only have four minutes left. Um, so maybe for the audience, if people listening to us right now want to dig a little deeper, dive a little deeper into topics around the uh, open web, also um, developments in India, maybe. What is like an article or something that you would recommend or an organization aside from your own organizations, maybe? Um, what would you recommend like people to look into um, or to have a, to, to, to read through, to, to just get a better overview and to dive a little deeper in, in, in some, into some topics? What inspired um, you and your work maybe as well? Um, and I'm also gonna take notes because I'm curious uh, what you would say. Something you read recently that inspired you for, for your own work? So I read this op-ed uh, uh, in the New York Times uh, just about two to three days back, and it's called How to Take on the Tech Barons. It's actually editorial by the New York Times. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit political, but uh, it does uh, display a level of thought uh, uh, that um, how conventional regulation and how industries which have grown and flourished do need a certain degree of moderation at certain periods of time when they start having social impact. I just found that to be very insightful, even for India, because India has the highest number of users for a lot of these Silicon Valley platforms. Thank you, noted. I think uh, very quickly, I think the two um, organizations which have played a role one is uh, Wikipedia, just uh, uh, their, their idea of scaling uh, uh, through, through their whole process of value and how do they get the community together. And I think the other one, which is a very interesting organization is Public Lab, uh, uh, which is again based out of the US and Ashoka Fellow, wherein uh, they make uh, citizen scientists and um, uh, how citizens play a role in data and technology there and building that community around that. For, for me, I think these two, uh, organizations have made me think about things in a very different way. Thanks. So you added the thing about, uh, apart from the organizations here, uh, because I was going to refer to IFF and to reap benefit itself. Uh, but since you asked for other organizations, a few things no, that think, are- yeah. <laughs> up, to you. up to you. <laughs> yeah, but a few things uh, that I think are good uh, and very good case studies coming out at least of, out of India is, uh, because it's not all doomsday, uh, is I think uh, right now the application of NLP and audio processing uh, in India is actually making the web more accessible to a lot of people. And it's opening up pathways for a lot of people to use uh, uh, internet in very different ways uh, to improve their livelihoods. Uh, the second one uh, that I see a lot of work that is happening in India right now is there's a discussion and a debate between uh, technologists and sociologists uh, because uh, it has been sort of 
accelerated because of the increased so we are all technophiles at heart in india that's what i like to say uh, so because the government has adopted technology in such a big way uh, it's put the spotlight on all the uh, moles and the warts uh, that te- uh, technology has right so the conversation between technologists and sociologists has increased and you see a lot of academic spaces labs as well opening up which are investigating uh, te- the role of technology in society and how that interplay really functions in the indian context So I'll stop there. Great. I'm afraid we're also out of time, but um, so we were worried in the beginning that this was would go into a dystopian uh, direction. <laughs> but I think it was a very hopeful discussion um, with uh, some good elements of like further reads and food for thought. Um, I of course also recommend uh, everyone listening to uh, check out the work of uh, the individual organizations. We really only got to. Uh, Uh, scrap the the surface uh, of what you're doing, uh, the work that you're doing to keep the web open and to get more people uh, to participate. Um, thank you for this discussion. I hope we'll have another uh, chance uh, to to reconnect. And yeah, thank you for your work. Keep up the good work and have a good evening or afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>